Let me know, Caleb. Yeah, yeah I guess it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> is it for $4? Is that right? Yeah, I just tell, yeah, I don't know what she told me that number that I gave you, but I don't know if it's right or not. So it was $30 total. She's given me $15. She gave 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 me $15. Yeah, I love the Valerian. Well, 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 I don't know. I mean, yeah, whether that was 
here a couple well, last week and of last week um, so it's helpful to hear what you'd like some more details on and I can pass out reference material um, a lot of this um, you've probably seen but just to have um, to go over and to reference one, package, it's one <laughs> big pack everything you need to <laughs> have but you know, um, actually you heard that all our, all our files were went up with the milder mold issue here. So oh, this is okay. actually good. Okay. Thank you. I'll start with the big folded infographic uh, for the new priorities uh, for this year um, that we gave a brief overview uh, last week. Uh, specifically for housing, um, once again, it's our distant housing incentive package we're calling uh, VHIP, which involves the downtown tax credit um, increase of $200,000, um, some technical changes. Um, my under latest understanding is the downtown tax credit um, 
there, there's a sponsor in, in House Commerce, and that will be working up through uh, the House side as a starting point. Um, and then the rental rehab program combined with the land gains um, disincentive fix, we're calling it, um, may have some interest on the Senate side, and we'd be happy to um, you know, consider combining it with other packages or um, considering you know, some changes here and there. But the basic premise is um, we have a excellent you know, housing delivery system. We um, are recognized nationally as having a top-notch um, nonprofit housing um, coalition of folks that do great work all across the state. Uh, and we do an excellent job of that. And in the housing investment report, which is in that packet, it really lays out how much is spent each year, um, what the main funders are, how we get to our housing policy between the QAP, Qualified Action um, Allocation Plan, which are for the low-income housing tax credits, both the federal and the state um, tax credits, and then the consolidated plan, which is the plan our department submits to HUD for the roughly $11 million in HUD funding, which includes the Community Development Block Grant Program, the HOME Program, which um, we contract with VHCB to administer, um, the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, although that, that doesn't come through that allocation, there's a connection there to ensure that the uh, homeless shelters and their coordination with um, providing housing and services for homeless folks. And so this- so That all comes out of the 11 million? Yes. That's it. That's it. I mean, that's a lot of stuff coming out of it. It is. It, it is. And then there's also in this report um, all of the rental assistance and services. Um, so this, ch there's several charts in here. I think that is the most comprehensive overview of housing funding, both uh, bricks and sticks. Um, so if the charts start on page 11. and you'll see that for Department of Housing and Community Development, state general funds, we actually receive very little, 122,000. And that's just a part of staff time um, to administer the federal funds that we put into housing. This, sorry, this includes all sources of funding through all agencies, local agencies, not just stuff that you touch. This is supposed to be a comprehensive um, report of all housing dollars that go through us, VHCB, Vermont, um, Housing Finance Agency, Vermont State Housing Authority, and AHS. Um, when you get to the chart, it has combined state and federal, it's, it's state and federal funds. Um, this doesn't encompass uh, private charitable foundations uh, that, that support housing. But you'll see that there's um, state Would and federal. Would that be like Habitat for Humanity or something like that? Correct. Is there a lot of money in this state for those kinds of charity? I, I would say not a ton, but Habitat also does receive some federal and state funding. We've funded Habitat, uh, Habitat programs in Charlotte um, and other areas around the state to build housing. So they also receive federal and state funds, but they certainly raise but they don't kick back money to us. I mean, there isn't money coming. There's no inflow to the state from those things. But you'll see under the um, state and federal combined funds for housing assistance and subsidy, AHS is a big player in housing support. So this is an attempt just to show folks what is happening. And um, the administration's proposal is to deal with the 87% of the rental housing stock that doesn't receive any of these funds. Um, yeah. And in a way that is very efficient, uh, small incentive. Um, you know, our proposal, if you've seen that the white paper is a five to $7,000 incentive grant that has to be matched at least 200% by um, the private uh, owner per unit. This is each unit. Um, that's based on an existing program that's run by one of our nonprofit housing partners and in fact is um, actually started in all of the five homeowner, nonprofit homeownership centers around the state. Um, they all receive funding from our federal funds 
to do low and moderate income home repairs and also um, up to 10% for rental rehab. So when you say the proposal deals with 87% of housing stock that's not touched by public funds, are you saying that, you're, that any housing that's touched by state or federal funds is not eligible for this new program? Um, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that currently the, 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 the system, the resources we have, a program like this doesn't exist. And that we think with a million dollar incentive, we can um, incent 122, at least 122 units to be brought back online that aren't currently online. They're either vacant or blighted or they just aren't in, in use. Um, I see it in communities all over the state that we talk to. Uh, but you know, right now their options are go borrow against that property. Um, and they're just not doing it. So we think um, some government being part of a solution here, a uh, small incentive, if we can get that sort of impact, is worth a, worth a try. I, I think you mentioned that you served on the Rental Code Enforcement Task Force as well. Well, our, our department, and that's in this pack as well, the final report, um, the Rental Housing Advisory Board recommendations. Yeah. And there's some short-term ones and some longer-term ones. And one of the main longer-term goals to actually address the problem is to support a program like this. Okay, because I was wondering, there seems to be some connection mm -hmm. that we could be merged as we go forward, you know, trying to mm -hmm. enforce, you know, substandard housing and you're proposing money for substandard housing. So Absolutely. It seems like there should be some joinder, maybe not so long-term, but now. Right. Absolutely. Senator, on page 27, there's a, oh, a discussion for resources in the, the rental, housing. rental housing advisory board report. Right. The one without a pretty cover. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, this is fine. Sarah brought this to us. Right. So the resources need, resource needs for landlords on page 27 is essentially laying out this exact program and references the one pilot project that this is based on down in um, Bennington with the neighborhoods of Western Vermont. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have to say that um, I look at these doc, this document, and I haven't read it cover to cover, certainly, but it really gives me comfort that there's a lot of actual numbers and action plans and clear descriptions, and I wish you could go over and work with workforce development for a while <laughs> and get them to produce something similar. Instead of drop it, like you see, get it done on one page. <laughs> that, that workforce development, I will claim, is not something I um, have expertise in. <laughs> Mr. Chair, can I just ask a clarifying question? So you're saying this is only for uh, units that are currently offline? That is how the program, the pilot that we have now is run, and that's okay. that's our proposal. Okay. But this wouldn't be paint and carpet. This would be right, exactly. Right. I just wanted to be clear yep. that it, it it does it does partner with our other goals, but it's different, right? Because it's, people are not currently in these units, right? And so it's about bringing more into the into use. Into right. use, yeah. You know, this is addressing our rental housing shortage. Right. As opposed to this isn't people who are currently living in substandard apartments, mm -hmm. right? We also have work to do there, but this is absolutely. But yes. if, if the enforcement of those substandard yes. apartments becomes um, somewhat professionalized, right. then they might go offline. They might right. go offline, Understood. and we need to have a response. Yeah. And, and it also is addressed. And you don't have this, but I'm sure you've heard from Vermont Legal Aid and their evictions in Vermont, mm -hmm. and they have a similar recommendation on page 19 about some sort of uh, expanded rental subsidies um, and affordable housing programs um, to reduce, you know, to, to address the same problem. So it, it comes up um, from a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different organizations, a lot of sides of the housing crisis. You know, this is not the type of money to, um, you know, build net new units. Right. Um, you know, it's not an attempt to, to try to uh, take part of the pie away, but add to it. Um, you know, unfortunately, if you look at the statistics for building permits in Vermont, they're not going in the right direction. Um, 
the housing data website through uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency is just done an overhaul. There's incredible data on there now that you can drill down to your community level, look at the age of your housing stock, the, how the um, price is going between single family, multifamily, um, mobile homes, manufactured, and you can see the number of building permits for single family homes and rentals issued each year in Vermont going back to the 80s. And the last bump was 2004. The last bump before that was 1984. Um, you know, so we've been in a, a, a decline in the number of building permits issued since 2005. For new builds. For new builds. Um, Which is not all building permits, because building permits are also for rehabs and renovations. That probably wouldn't be tracked. These are, these are for multifamily and single family new building permits reported by the municipality. So some municipalities might not report anything, but you know, for example, in 2017, there were 1,700 total units. That's multifamily and single family permitted. Um, and that's slightly less than in 2016 and slightly less than in 2015. You know, hopefully a lot of the new initiatives with the housing revenue bond and, and all the private building going on in Chittenden County in 2018 numbers when they come out, hopefully we'll see a spike. But even with that sort of incentive, um, you know, we can't build new our way out of the problem. We, we have to bring our existing units that are offline back into use. The upper stories of our downtowns, um, all those sort of properties need to be part of um, our landscape for housing and we, we're not um, making progress there. So we need some new innovative ways to, uh, to, to try to turn this around. And that's so, what so this is. So do you label this or consider this like a pilot project? And what I mean by that is it already in your knowledge that it's far more demand for this kind of program than being put out with a million dollars? We believe so. Um, you know, the, the challenge here is there's always a balance. You know, when I have small landlords call me and they, they, I've got this eviction problem or my building's falling apart, can I, is there grants available or is there loans available? I hear about affordable housing crisis, but I really don't have any equity in this property. I can't really afford to raise rents in my neighborhood. Um, where, where do I go? Um, I, I don't have a good answer for them. Um, but the challenge is the incentive has to be right sized for the um, commitment we're going to ask of them. Um, and that if we have too many barriers, the, the, they, they won't accept the funding and, and work won't get done. So it's a balance of what we offer and what we ask in return. And, and that's good, that's all the granular stuff. But I guess I'm just concerned if you had another million dollars and put the same parameters on it, could that work as well? I mean, I think so, but I think it's a smarter um, plan to uh, learn best practices, learn some mistakes, fix. We, you know, we have to partner with local um, housing groups on the ground. Right. We can't overwhelm them too right. fast right. Um, and dial this in uh, so it's the best program we can have. Senator Clarkson. So uh, an example of what you're talking about is uh, a number of years ago, we did a uh, housing study in Woodstock uh, about rental housing and affor rental, affordable rental housing. There was a need immediately tomorrow for 300 more units. We have vacant second and third floor space in our wonderful historic downtown. Walking this is perfect for what we're talking about that are going unused for a variety of reasons, but would really significantly be, I think, affected by this kind of program. My concern is, is this enough? These units are unused for reasons. Is this incentive enough for the problems that they're going to have to be addressed? Right. I, mean, I would welcome you to invite Ludi Biddle in or someone from her staff. Um, I've seen a lot of great before and after pictures. You know, and the entire was, house. Our first was 7,500, right? 7,500. But Which it had some five. federal. But they started at 8,500, and they've been able to drop it to 7,500 and still have interest. Um, and you know, these apartments, this wasn't cosmetic. I mean, this was entirely new kitchens, new bathrooms. Outside looks wonderful. You'd like to live next to this house now that was an eyesore before. Right. Um, 
and you don't want because they can also attract some other incentives. Efficiency Vermont can provide some, you know, um, rebates for new appliances, and it starts to grow and, and feel that the state is, you know, supporting their efforts to bring quality housing, um, you, you know, to the community with with without. Um, you know, over overburdening their efforts, really. And, and so that, that's the balance we're trying to strike here. So the second question I have for you is, uh, the 122 units you're hoping to affect, um, is there a plan or a set of criteria that will ensure that they are done around the state? And how, what's the selection? How, what's the selection? So we, that is um, a great question because I, I personally, don't think the best strategy would be just to scatter it across the whole state. I think we need to focus on a few regions to for economies of scale, to give the, the nonprofit folks that would um, you know, o oversee this at the local level a chance to be successful. Um, you know, we don't spell out exactly how, but you know, my thought would be if this money's approved and we have the flexibility, we would work with our partners uh, that do this work that are already getting federal funds to do this put out an RFP, let them um, propose uh, the solution. It might be that they sort of sub with each other um, somewhat, but I would venture that this would work best to focus on a couple counties. So if we do this bill as a committee bill, or however we do it, we could put those parameters in, because it's just important to track how it's success, you know, to track mm -hmm. and see what our measurables are at mm -hmm. the end of a year or two. Mm -hmm. And the time frame is a year? Uh, I mean, if, I mean, it would take more than a year to get these units uh, rehabbed and online. It, it takes a couple years to, we're talking about, you know, someone holding an escrow, the property owner's money, so dispersing it to make sure they have codes. And, you know, we don't want to see this money be given out as incentives and, and not, it's going to be managed in some. So how long did the pilot program? So it's a year and a half in okay. and they're proposing 22 units and they're about halfway. There are about 12 have been done and they've got the others, you know, people online, but it, it takes a couple years. So if we gave it two years right. and tracked with... This is the Bennington. Program. Yes. So, you know, so you mentioned uh, the housing bond. Were you, were you involved in that or peripherally? Uh, I guess I'm gonna wanna know from all the witnesses because, you know, we did that work here and we wanna know the fruits of our labor. Right. How did it go? Have they run into problems? Or I think that would be something? best for Gus or, or Jen to you know, speak to. You know, we certainly were involved, but okay. we're not managing it. Um, we're aware of the great projects that are being funded with it. A lot of them are joint efforts with um, the federal CDBG funds, the home funds, the tax credits, um, and there's certainly some of the projects that have uh, benefited from the housing revenue bond have been the transforming projects around the state that we all needed to get done, um, but they would be best to speak to that. Okay, and then, yeah, we'll spend a fair amount of time with them on that, but from the administration's perspective, have you seen that as a, a big winner, a big problem area? Uh, oh no, a winner, for sure. And these are properties that, when you're building brand new, um, you know, 30 unit uh, multifamily apartment building, or you're renovating French Block in downtown Montpelier, um, you know, with a, uh, a, a nonprofit housing organization, um, we're building these to last, to be under ownership forever. Right. Um, and it's an intense undertaking. Um, there's a reason that the costs are different than what we're proposing with a small um, rental rehab where it's staying in private owner's hands. We're not sure. um, taking any, you know, mortgage of the property. We're not putting parameters around um, those that we think people would turn down that $5,000 incentive in a second if they felt like they actually couldn't manage their properties um, in the long term. Um, do, you, do you think we move too fast on that bond? I don't think so. I think that, you know, I think everyone would love to even move faster, but things take time. You know, there's permits, there's other resources that are needed to pull those projects off. and. You know, some of these resources are committed a year or two, two out, and so we can only um, put together projects as the resources come together. So, um, 
it's been nothing but positive from the administration's perspective on the results of the housing revenue bond. Um, but it was a big deal for you know the, the state, big undertaking, and it you know it we. Um, I mean, I think we would all love to see that sort of investment be available continually and ongoing, but there's, you know, priorities for funds, and that's, it's hard to make that level of commitment each year. Well, and that one organization is shouldering the burden of that, quite honestly, in large measure. Right. It would be great if we had a way to roll it every right. two years and have the burden of it borne by Right. The right. The other thing I would just point out is that um, in the packet also, you know, the, the other housing programs and things we work on, the blue infographics are, um, you know, meant to be a snapshot of the work the department does uh, in all areas. But I can point out the housing pieces and give you a sense of what those numbers mean. Um, so the Vermont Community Development Program is the federal CDBG program. That's all we have for housing at the department um, for housing production, uh, both rehab of existing units and new. And you know, with um, our modest uh, resources, we've got to split this between infrastructure and economic development and planning and public services and all sorts of projects we end up doing about 60 to 70% of our funding each year for affordable housing. But last year we were able to um, support 426 units with our, our federal funding. That's both uh, net new um, properties. Um, so purchasing? Uh, building. Or, or renovating? Both. Um, and also our home ownership centers, um, taking uh, low income homeowners, because homeowners are still 70% of our households live in, in home ownership situations, but many of them are low income as well. They have no equity in the home. You know, there's drastic uh, need for repair. So we spend a lot of our funding through the uh, nonprofit housing organizations and their home ownership centers, the NeighborWorks organizations to give deferred loans, um, grants in many cases, low interest loans, financial counseling, weatherization, around the, the state. Is that the 3,611 people touched assisted that you're talking about? That would be, that number is a um, conservative 2.2 persons per household of the 426, if that makes sense. And uh, what's the universe look like? How many are low income Vermonters are eligible, eligible to be assisted in that? I mean, so what's, what there's, does this represent? Like there's the no shortage of, of uh, I think, you know, Brenda's certainly here from one of the groups that, that does this work. There's no shortage of applicants, but there are very tough decisions that have to be made because a lot of people have no ability to pay back any of the funds, and we can only grant so much. Um, right, but is this half? Half? Um, so, or is there? Uh, just less than half. Uh, in another piece, because we, like I said, we loaded you with resources. The Vermont Community Development Annual Report has all of the, every single grant that was awarded. And there's a listing of the housing projects that were funded on the back of page two. And you can see which municipality they went to, what was the project, and how many units. Oh yeah, Twin Pine, you did some of these. So for example, um, the Champlain Housing Trust Home Repair Loan Program, that was 50 units. We fund mobile home parks, um, all sorts of housing across the state. And a lot of these projects are the same projects that receive a lot of, of funding. So these are, I can't claim these are unduplicated 426 units. These are um, investments that a lot of us have made across the state. Um, but we do uh, support the mobile home park program, which is not represented really anywhere else um, in, in any of the reports. And, and, where, and that is- Where is that here? Um, so on the infographic, the mobile home park program itself is on the back of the second page. Oh, right at the bottom. And with a small, so that $72,000 is part of a majority of the salary of, of the, the administrator of the program, which is collected from 
lot fees. Each mobile home lot registers with the state through the mobile home park owner, whether they're private, nonprofit, or cooperative owned. And that pays for a lot of services and assistance and outreach back to the residents. Um, we have a grant with CBOEO um, to provide direct resident assistance. And the 4,946 housing units preserved, that is not every unit. That is just the ones over the last year that we directly assisted with allotment, lot rent mediation, uh, a park sale notice, a closure notice, or had habitability complaints that we had to work with um, the owners to resolve. Um, so it's really, for a small uh, general fund investment, touching a lot of low income Vermonters. Um, you know, these are stressful transactions when mobile home parks are up for sale or closure. We have fortunately had a lot of good uh, results over this past year. Most of all the sales have resulted in agreements to, to go co-op and have the residents own them. Um, they're Which not without right. problems um, and some of those haven't, the final paperwork has not been solved, but uh, not been signed, but they're headed in the right direction in, in all those cases. So we hear a lot of direct um, from Vermonters about mobile home concerns. And, and we hear right. every time the lot rent goes up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. It's a circle of communication, yes. isn't it, Dave? It is. <laughs> so, uh, Josh, I have a couple of specific questions and then a general question. And then we're going to turn it over to the next witness. But um, where is the $1 million coming from for this program? The general fund? General fund. It's you know, built into our budget, um, budget bill. Um, is it an addition or is it grading some other public money? It, our um, department, our agency budget um, is level funded. Um, we have uh, trying to. I, I don't know where it was found within the entire enterprise of the state budget, uh, but it's built into ours um, without rating any of our existing housing funds or any of our programs. Um, okay. Well, I think I'd be interested just if you can get back to us to yep. say where, where, where did you find that right. money? Uh, right. I know Senator Brock always asked the question, well, found the money, maybe you didn't need it. <laughs> Um, Either that or... And then the, the second question I have is, on getting rid of the land gains tax, is there, in your mind, any thought given to, as opposed to totally getting rid of it, maybe shortening the period? Because I mean, I think the land gains tax was originally established was to deal with speculators and people right. flipping things, Reduce and now we're right. we opening the door to some of that again. Right. You know, and I, I, I um, Doug Farnham is coming with us on Friday for testimony um, to talk specifically about this. So I, I don't, I don't think I could speak okay. to it. To it. Um, okay. And my general question, um, I don't know if you can answer or other people can answer. You look at these numbers here, and I love the word leverage. <laughs> I love the word matching funds. I love using federal <laughs> funds, and. As an advocate, you know, those are the kinds of numbers I always used to lead with. You know, give us a million dollars and we'll give you 50 back. Right. In all these housing programs, does that mean that none of the leverage dollars would have been spent other than if you put, the state put its small incentive in? I guess I would answer that very carefully in that many of these housing projects are leveraging lots of sources it's a complicated uh, pro forma and if you take any one of them out it, it could be at risk of not being um, built at all so sure you know some project may be able to um, figure out a way to make up a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in their budget if they didn't get one of the various sources but in general they all kind of work together to uh, pull off all the housing that we're able to, to do it in this state. Um, and if you take one out, uh, it, it, I'm not sure where we'd be. The structure. Yeah. 
And how many, on average, do these projects leverage? How many different buckets of money, on average, do these projects leverage? It's like ten, four. probably. I mean, ten. on average, you know, and, and, and it's as small right, as the little local revolving loan fund, that, the housing trust fund, that one. Yeah. Um, it's it's all the way to federal, um, you know, federal uh, AHP funding from Boston. It's it's across the board. It's really um, a lot of hard work to to pull these projects off. And just really, when I, mean, I look at a number like your community planning and revitalization, yep. six million dollars invested, three hundred and sixty million dollars leveraged. Yes. I look at that and I say, you know, unless there's some federal yeah. requirements or strings and stuff like that, couldn't it just been that those leverage dollars just went up six million dollars and you didn't need the state dollars to? It's such a multiplier, it's crazy. Right. And, well, you know, we see that in the downtown program. Too. That's I mean, huge. Where this, a lot of this is coming from the um, downtown tax credits. Um, you know, and that would, you know, clearly uh, Chris Cochran that, that runs the downtown tax credit and the community vitaliz planning or vitalization division could give you lots of details. And, you know, it's hard to say whether it would never have happened in any shape or form, but yeah. certainly the reports we get back are that it made a difference for them to at least go this big, take it to that level. Um, they have to go through a complicated process. To, and I think if they didn't need the money, they wouldn't take that extra step and bother to report to us. It, it really does make a difference. Well, you know, it, it, just from a cynical perspective, when I see an investment that turns over 60 times the amount of money. Right. We might as well just put the, all our money in state government right. to that program and we'd go home. Absolutely, I, I hear you. <laughs> I think if it was that easy, we'd be able to solve all of our budget problems around here. But in addition to leveraging the ca the additional cash to make these projects happen, it, it really puts, even if it's a small amount of skin in the game, it's Vermont's skin in the game. And, right. you know, it's, it's essential Absolutely. to, to well, show our support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay tuned. We right. expect to be doing a lot in our ah. housing. Excellent. Thank you. Kayla, would you kind of get a page for that? Yeah. 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 Uh, the thing for me, anyhow, Gus, and your officer of the other questions is, Thank you. you know, sort of light on everything the HCP does, a little bit more detail on how the housing bond has worked out, and, and where we go from here with your experience, what more can we be doing? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So for the record, I'm Gus Seelig. I'm the director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. With me is our policy and special projects director, Jen Holler. Um, and we will focus primarily on the housing revenue bond. I'll give a very brief overview. Um, and so if you turn to the second slide, uh, the second page, um, this is our statutory mission um, uh, to do both housing and conservation. But what's important to me about the mission statement is the reason we do it is because it's to promote the economic vitality and quality of life for the state. And we really do focus on economic vitality. I think when the board was invented, we were viewed both as a the state jumping into areas that the federal government had retreated from, both in the housing and conservation world. Back in the 80s, we were a non-regulatory tool to support good land use. Uh, the photo you see on this slide is actually North Bennington and Shaftesbury. Um, and the body of water is called Lake Heron. About 10 years ago, a group of interested citizens worked with us to conserve some land around the pond, develop a recreation area. This year, that same group's come back. And uh, where that red mark is, uh, they are selling to Shires Housing, a site for affordable housing. It's just over the North Bennington line. You can walk down. Oh, yeah, this on the water? Uh, not on the water, but near the water. Uh, it's actually on the on or near the road is where it is, where the housing will be. Um, and they, they will build 23 homes there with the housing revenue bond. Uh, and the school in North Bankton, all the services there are quite walkable uh, from this site. 
Um, the next slide just very, I will not dwell on, but tells you what we've done over the 30 years we've been around for both the housing and conservation part of our mission. And I would just say there are not enough, but there are other tools uh, such as the lead-based paint program that does work both with homeowners and with landlords in a manner you were recently discussing. Um, most folks, going to the next slide, think of us as two programs, housing and conservation. We think of ourselves as running all of these programs, 14 different programs. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, we talked briefly, and I hope I'll be able to come back at a certain point really to focus with the committee on our rural, our economic development and rural community development aspects of our work, which I'm not going to spend time on today, but I would appreciate the opportunity to address that. To go to the next side, slide, uh, there is more and more research, not just good feeling, that housing is critical to people's well-being and health over the long term. Uh, the MacArthur Foundation has done some uh, research on this, and they show uh, substandard housing contributing to developmental delays. Uh, homelessness has clearly been viewed as something that really is disruptive for kids. Uh, there's a Boston outfit, uh, Children's Health Watch, which um, basically views housing as a vaccine that keeps one from being ill. And um, they, they've testified in front of your Health and Welfare Committee a couple of years ago, uh, but there's more and more evidence that there are some societal costs when people are not adequately housed that we all have yeah. for. Uh, Read novels and you know that. Before we <laughs> get into um, <laughs> the specifics of the housing revenue bond, uh, the next two slides I just want to make two points about. The first one, uh, which Senator Hooker is familiar with, is in Rutland. This is Hickory Street. We celebrated the conclusion, actually almost conclusion, of a 10-year effort to redevelop that whole neighborhood. It was a very poorly built and poorly managed, over a long period of time, public housing development that is that was not on the community's tax rolls because it was public housing and it has now been redeveloped as a high quality neighborhood. Uh, the streetscape was also changed so that it doesn't dead end in this development. And really, I think what we shoot for the most is not just the leverage you were talking about, Mr. Chairman, but the transformation in the investments that we're making. So, Gus, are these um, multi, is this a multi it's a mixed income, multi-unit development. There are still three sites to build single family homes here as well. Uh, but it's a 70, 79 unit neighborhood altogether. So and how many are rented and how many are owned? All of this that's been done up to now is rental housing, but okay. it is mixed income uh, using the tax credit program. Um, there will be three single family homes built across the street from here as a single family neighborhood. Uh, as well. And there are units specifically dedicated for homeless here. Okay. Well, there are. There are. So go to the next slide. This is up in Franklin, Vermont. Um, and I, the story I want to tell you about this is a fellow named Hugh Gates, former representative, walked into our office in the early 1990s. Uh, he had just won, uh, or his phone company, he owned the Franklin phone company, had won a lottery and he wanted to do something for the elders of Franklin. And um, when he talked to people in Burlington at various funding agencies, they said, Franklin, Vermont, up on the Canadian border, we don't think it's sustainable. And he, as many of you who serve here, know more about your communities than we do in Montpelier or Burlington. He knew his community. Uh, we helped him build the first phase. It was so successful that he added an assisted living uh, component in a second phase. And for 25 years, it has been great housing up there. And what I, so I want to say two things about that. One is that we try to make investments that are going to be permanent in nature, permanently protect people from being uprooted and displaced. We were created at a time that we were losing federal housing because developers came to the end of their agreements with the federal government and actually just said, okay, I'm, I have a site in Essex, 100 families, I can convert this to market rate housing, double the rents, and all those families lost their housing. The other thing I want to say, though, from a budget perspective, is that 90% of what you do here is about next year. And when you make investments in housing and in housing through us, and we're the one part of state government where you're making capital investments, they're going to benefit your communities and your constituents long after 
the year that you make the investment in. Oh. So they will continue to pay dividends um, in any number of ways. So in this case, we managed to leverage lottery funds, huh? <laughs> you met, uh, at, not only lottery funds, yeah. Mr. Gates went to the cemetery commission and he borrowed from the cemetery oh, commission right. to get yeah. this built. So he was, he was very creative. <laughs> he was. Um, and I knew his community well to know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so to get to the housing revenue bond, um, it was signed into law just 18 months ago. Uh, the sale exceeded the expectations we expected based on the early estimates to raise 35 million. We actually raised 37 million. We have now committed 25 million dollars, uh, and that will leverage another just about 140 million dollars. We anticipate that the rest of the bond will be uh, allocated to various projects by the end of this calendar year. Uh, the photo you're looking tell me, at. Tell me just a little bit about the $140 million mm -hmm. that was leveraged. <laughs> what, what are the, what are the typical dollars. sources of that $140 million? Uh, the, probably the single biggest source is leveraging the low-income housing tax credit. Um, we are doing some home ownership, so we're leveraging people's ability to go get mortgages. We're leveraging uh, funding through groups like Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we're leveraging uh, in the Putnam block, which I'll get to in a right. minute, a, a whole different array of funding than, than we're usually leveraging. We're also doing several public-private partnerships, and in that $140 million, I am not counting uh, additional units that private sector builders are, have pledged to build on a couple sites as well. So they're, they're pledging something like almost 300 additional units that I don't count as leverage because we're not directly investing in those units, but our investments are making their developments possible. What would be very helpful at some point, and Jen, I think I asked you uh, about some of this about a year ago, is to see a graphic that would show the flow of funds uh, in terms of what you're investing such as the housing bond money. You know the housing bond money ultimately gets repaid to the bondholders. But as part of the leverage, there are a variety of mortgages created and other financial instruments. And to see that flow of funds graphically in terms of uh, either in total, which I know would be complex, but in terms of some specific situations to show how this works in practice would be very helpful to us. We'd be happy to come up with some examples that would, would help it. And while there are similarities, every deal is a little bit different, but we can give you three or four examples that would... Because I'm particularly interested, for example, in the fact that part of the leveraging that, that goes on uh, results in a continued uh, increase in the amount of debt on the state's books, which now is approaching about $200 million, as I recall, as to say, how is that being dealt with? How is that, what does that leveraging mean in terms of repayment? And is repayment, in fact, current? I'd be happy to have that conversation with you and not jump into that right now, Thank but you. I think we appreciate the opportunity to talk about, about that. So just going back, and it's related to that question, because I remember when we did the bond, uh, <clears throat> there is always some tension about how much debt affordability the state could take on, and that this was somehow separate from the state's debt load that's had its own, okay. I can forget the terminology, but... Um, so just to go back to some of that, what you did in establishing the bond um, was it is not a general obligation to the state of Vermont. It was issued, the debt was issued by the Vermont Housing and Finance Agency. You created what was called a lockbox structure in which we're contributing a million and a half dollars and then you did a surcharge on the transfer tax and another million dollars is going into that lockbox as the first receipts from the property transfer tax, which raises over $40 million a year. So the first two and a half million goes into the lockbox. So it did not become a general obligation of the state of Vermont. I think Senator Brock is actually referring to our own financial statements, which is a different, a slightly different question that we do want to address with the Senator. Okay, so. So you basically. Because we, we, we do take those, those so bond proceeds and make loans generally deferred loans to the deals that we're involved in. So to the extent we can do sustainability bonds, we have to worry less about the debt 
dealing with general obligation bonds are totally separate as long as you find a way to service the debt. If you can identify the revenue and, and essentially lock it in. Right. right. Then Which is what you did. And, and, and identify yeah. it. doesn't affect our debt ceiling. You all get right. the credit okay, for so that. It doesn't affect it, but let's say something goes wrong. Do we have like the good faith and credit of the state behind VHFA somehow? I think, the, I don't think you pledge, and I'll have to, we'll have to check with VHFA, Sometimes you pledge the mor what's called the moral obligation of the right, state. Right. I don't think you did in this case. Um, and what would have to go wrong in order for the bondholders, to, because you created this lockbox and you have a funding source that's generating forty million dollars, you'd have to there'd have to be such a depression that what was set aside that real estate activity decreased by over ninety percent before that eventuality of not having that first two and a half million would ever come to pass. So the investors considered it to be a very safe investment from their perspective. So, um, so just to get back to the what we've, what we've done with the bonds, uh, one of the picture here on this first page is in Manchester, Vermont. This is a development that where 12 condominium units were built uh, with our support. Uh, and the development had to stop in the midst of the Great Recession. So we're funding an additional eight units uh, now to get it to the full permitted build out, and that will produce home ownership there. And how many will it be total? 20. 20. It's done. Oh, 20. And so, that will be good for all the folks who are already living in that development as well as they so thought they were yeah. buying into so, it. So, so you know you have a wide range of housing opportunities through VHCV whether it's home ownership or rentals and is are there any additional variations or restrictions with these funds as opposed to what you could do with your general fund appropriate or property transfer tax appropriations each year as to how you I mean you make decisions you have a board you say this project looks good we need more of this less of that so we need to be much, I guess all of it's perpetually affordable but um, when you come to this pot of money, is there anything different? Um, yes, and that gets to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, so what you did was to ask us to target a quarter of the homes to people below 50% of median. And what was different here is you asked us to target a quarter of the homes to people between 80 and 1. Right. right. And uh, we've had that authority uh, in past years, and particularly uh, your colleagues in the Appropriations Committee have said, please focus on the most vulnerable and please leverage as much federal money as you possibly can. Um, and the federal programs basically cut off either at 60% of median or 80% of median. So what the bond has enabled us to do is to develop more units um, that are for that group that are between above 60% of median and up to 120, which we serve, have generally served to a much lesser degree. And that's been the biggest single change and obviously the bond is restricted to our housing activities not any of our conservation work but you mentioned home ownership i just clear that there's more than just home ownership there are rental properties out of this money too right? home ownership rental properties and we are also the governor's asked us to serve the most vulnerable and we'll get to a slide a couple slides on that for people who are really um, among the most vulnerable as well but more purpose-built what we call purpose-built housing with a strong social service component to it. Um, and as this slide says, and I think I said a moment ago, uh, the private sector builders that our partners are working with are also have also advised they're going to build on these sites another almost 300 units over the next few years. Um, so in terms of success and remembering that we're talking about a construction program and it was just authorized um, 18 months ago. We funded 21 projects, uh, about 550 homes across nine counties. First 86 families have moved into three developments around the state. There are 240 homes under construction as we speak. There's about another 200 set to get going next spring, summer, and fall as well. And this, this, the photo here, and you also saw it on the um, front of the report that Josh talked about, is in Putney, and it was one of the first projects to be completed with housing revenue bond funds. It's also got um, 
funding through um, the agency, through the um, Community Development Block Grant Program. But we, we contribute and, and coordinate with the agency on that report each year. So, uh, Gus and Jen, could you give us a notion of, uh, again, what the universe of need is here? I mean, as you identify it now, what roughly is the need that we are not meeting at the moment? Um, well, I, I mean, this is great. This is great, and we're thrilled. But what? Well, what's how? It's do. thousands of new. Yes. Right, right. It's we're we're going to get. I'd like to remind you. We're, we're, we're going to get. We're, before we're we there. get done, we'll give you a bunch of numbers that. that but it, it is <laughs> it's in the thousands. Yeah, it's no, it's depending. huge. Yes. That's sort of what I'm. Yeah, and, and that's why this next slide about this public-private partnership at Cambrian Rise, called Cambrian Rise, is so important. This is an architect's rendering of what it will look like on the build-out. And going back to our dual goal project, we worked with the city of Burlington and provided a grant for them, and the community did a lot of fundraising. So 12 acres along the lake is becoming a public park that this neighborhood, which adjoins the Old North End, will have access to, as will people from the Old North End. To the, to the lake. Does this connect uh, to Rock Point? No, Rock Point is, is further, further down. Us. And we did we have done some cons right. conservation with the I, 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 at Rock Point as well. But again, it goes to that dual mission. Um, this is going to be a mixed income neighborhood. Brenda Torpy's here. She may talk a little bit more about this. Um, we will, first development that we're involved in here is 76 unit family housing. That will open this summer when construction is completed. We just agreed to fund another 70-unit building. Uh, and there's also a large condominium building that will fund 21 units of the condominiums in uh, as affordable home ownership. The rest will be market rate housing. Um, and the total build out is about 700 units. So that it will add greatly to the housing supply and the shortage that Chittenden County is experiencing. The next project is in South Burlington. Uh, this building opened in November, 39 units of elderly. The private developers have a building of their own under construction, and again, the Champlain Housing Trust uh, has a 60-unit building that'll get, that is under construction now and will be completed next summer. What's interesting about this development is it's part of the city's fifth district and a, the development of a city center. So adjacent to this property, uh, the community is building a new building for their library and their town offices. Right. There's a school right around the corner. And again, the build out in the whole neighborhood by the developers will end up being in somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 homes, including the ones we support. And I think what we're seeing is private developers, and you'll have to ask them, but my working with nonprofit partners at the very beginning of a project, and I think that that helps them financially absorb their upfront infrastructure costs and their upfront lending to get some developments done right away and then it makes it easier for them to continue to build. And uh, with your private partnerships, these are nonprofits and for-profit private private partners? What the nonprofits do is they form uh, on these rental deals, they form a limited uh, partnership. They're the general partners. Uh, there are limited partners who are investors who are mostly investing in the low income housing tax credit. The private developers are, in the case of South Burlington, building the housing and selling it to the nonprofit at the end of construction. And they have additional land that they are planning and building on in that neighborhood as part of a master development they have um, with the city of South Burlington. So you think of them as turnkey projects. With the developer, the private construction company builds it, hands the keys over it. But then they, the extra, the, the extra that they have would not necessarily go to nonprofits, but would be just market rate housing for whomever can afford it. Do they do that? I mean, so that's for market rate. I can see that the, the, that might work, but for for something that's going to be low income. So this these thirty nine units for older Vermonters in South Burlington, that's market rate for them. No, that's going to be affordable that's housing. Going to be affordable. There will be some market rate units again in these developments. That's one of the requirements of the bond. So rather than doing projects that are uh, ninety or hundred percent just at the sixty percent of median, the bond is letting us stretch and so generally a chunk of each development is going to be at a higher income level and a higher rent level. Um, 
this next development is in Hartford. It is under construction. It should be completed by the fall. It's um, uh, right near lots of jobs and services, uh, and there's a phase two potential on the site. Um, I spoke to you a few minutes ago about the desire for transformation. So this is the Wilson Block in Springfield. Yes. Um, the commercial space has been vacant, I think, except for once or twice, pretty consistently for more than a decade. Yeah. Uh, the upstairs is needs an awful lot of work. Again, this will be mixed income housing. There will be four units and a program set up for at-risk homeless youth in the building. Uh, it's right in the center of town, and, it, and it's one of those kinds of investments that we look at as something that can be transformational for the downtown. It will be. And I this add that um, we may have heard from Matt Dunn or we're Bob hoping, Flint, yeah. the Springfield Regional Development, so around Brick, the Black River right. Innovation right. Center, and they're looking at, at, at this at really helping yeah. campus. Anchor it. <laughs> this and the Park Street yeah. School. Yes. Yeah. Be the two anchors. Yeah. Uh, so we visited with the governor this location across from the co-op and just down the street from the parking garage in downtown Brattleboro for groundbreaking in October, and we should have those 23 apartments up in the downtown, um, I would guess next fall, but that is also under construction. Who's that oh. short person? Who is that <laughs> short person next to us? <laughs> oh, it's me. <laughs> um, this one has been, this next short one has not been, has not been popular in this building. Uh, this is over on Taylor Street here in Montpelier because it's costing some of the parking spaces. Um, but Montpelier planned, um, back, going back to the early 1990s, got some funding for Transit Center. And uh, DEW was going to build housing above. And they just decided they could not make the numbers work. So Housing Vermont and Down Street Housing took on the upper stories here. And uh, again, 30 mixed income units, some very affordable and some closer to market will be for that 80 to 120 will be built here and it's under construction. And you can see it going up every day. So is, is this the one that's right behind the Capitol Plaza? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was their new Fairmont Hotel. Not yet. That hasn't Plaza. begun yet. That's another so that project. isn't under construction yet? No. Is that what's going to be on top of the new parking garage? No. Uh, believe it or not, it's planned to be between the back of the Capitol Plaza Hotel and the Transit Center. So if you are looking at the plaza, behind it will be a New Hampton Inn beyond that the transit center and the parking garage will be off to the left in behind the church right the parking yeah which but there's a big slow up on that at the moment which is right the parking is it it's going stale? to be yeah yeah okay so that brings an active question that i have like how do these intersect with act 250 and the report that's come out and there's there other problems these projects moving forward, the recommendations that have been set forth in the report. Generally, they're moving forward well, and there are two instances, including the Taylor Street, excuse me for interrupting, Please, the Taylor Street project in Cameron Rise that we also showed you that benefited from a provision that's currently Act 250 that gives um, um, a quicker approval process for what are known as priority housing projects. So projects that include some number of affordable units and that are within a designated area. So the permitting time frame and the um, costs were significantly lowered for Taylor Street here in Montpelier in the Cambrian Rise Project. So that's been a very meaningful incentive um, within currently Act 250. So as the as you think about any changes to that, that's something to keep in mind. But, but so far, things otherwise are moving forward. I'm not sure if we know many that have made big permitting issues right now. No, or there might not. There are always little ones, but. <laughs> Nothing that's okay. scaring us. <laughs> um, so uh, going on to transformation and downtown revitalization, the next slide is the Putnam Block in Bennington. Um, this is primarily not an affordable housing deal. This is a, uh, and I toured the upper stories here, which last about a year ago, which have been vacant since the 1970s. Right. Um, and um, the plan for the community is they've gotten Bennington College, Southern Vermont College, and their medical center all to agree the lease space 
in the redevelopment area. There's going to be some student housing that Bennington College, I think for master's students, is going to develop as well. And then some small apartments that we've agreed for that 80 to 120 range to subsidize. Uh, they're using something called New Markets Tax Credits uh, to make this happen. Uh, this project uh, got into difficulty in the midst of tax reform and their out-of-state New Markets investors backed out of the deal. And sat with Housing Vermont, which runs the Vermont program, and asked them what it would take to get them to increase their investment. And we increased our own, and we asked the community, there's a site on the back, to bank it uh, for 30 units of affordable housing down the road, which gives it much more of a low mod benefit feel, which is a requirement of the market's credit. And Housing Vermont then doubled their investment in this building, in this property. So, we expect it to get under construction this summer, uh, but it'll be, it's a big deal for Bennington. It's huge. Yes. The city of St. Albans um, has been also very creative and um, aggressive about their downtown, and they've done a terrific job. We just agreed last week to fund a 30-unit development, which is going to be across from City Hall. We're going to get a second application to adjoin that site that we'll consider later. And they've gotten community college to also, a developer is building a building at community college and their medical center will take up uh, several floors in. So it's part of the continuing effort of the city to reinvent itself and to make its downtown vital. It's a great site next to a park. Is this part of the TIF? Part of the TIF district as well. Just want to remind ourselves of all our work. So to focus for a moment on the most vulnerable and the housing revenue bond, uh, Senator Ballant was part of the group that was uh, at this site in Brattleboro, which was the old Lamplighter Motel. It was run oh, down. Okay. It was um, on the tax rolls for $5,000. It has been redeveloped. It's now on the tax roll as micro apartments. Half of them are absolutely dedicated to the homeless, um, and half the people who moved in moved in from a tent they were living in. Yeah. Um, and it's now on the tax rolls for a little over six hundred thousand dollars. And there is beautiful. a beautiful. service partnership that includes the local homeless service provider, the mental health agency, and the housing Windsor Windsor Housing Trust. And uh, I, I think they did it really well. And there are um, we think of the homeless in various ways, but the two kids moved in with their parents among the folks who moved in. And here. if I could just say in the green courtyard between one of the things that they were dedicated to doing is preserving this big climbing tree that is there so the kids that live on site have you know this connection to the natural world they did such a great job it's beautiful and if i could just add in terms of going back to that theme of coordination among the state housing agencies at this the vermont state housing authority made project-based vouchers available for this which makes helps get the rent between what's affordable to actually making it afford to someone who's low income to something that's affordable to someone who has no income and is coming out of a tent. And so that was a really key piece. Um, this next property is the Clara, is owned by the Clara Martin Center, which is the designated mental health agency for Orange County. And they purchased it and been vacant for a decade and it'll provide uh, four homes for people with chronic and persistent mental illness. So Gus, before you move on, can you talk to us a little bit more about the funding for this? I think this is something, this particular kind of unit, which is supported housing for the mentally ill, is something that I think a lot of counties are, are looking at. Just, can you just tell us a little bit more about how you made it work? Um, I'm not going to remember all the details. Or I can talk but, to Jen after but, or, but do you remember the details on it? But one of the things that the Met, the Department of Mental Health has is a housing contingency fund, and they pledged some of that funding to support the rents for the people who were going to live in this building. So that was a piece of the yep. funding for it. Do you remember I think that's right. and details? I would, or we need to well, I think that um, we can certainly provide more details on this, but the point that you're getting at is that in order to be able to serve these really vulnerable folks with persistent mental illness yeah. or other major um, needs where they have supports, you've really got to have the three legs of the stool you, you do. hear about all the time. And so we right provide the capital for yeah. the for the apartments or the renovations, right. but they need service supports. Yeah. And in some places, we've been able to piece that together, but in other places, the services just aren't there yet. So we could do more of this, but the services aren't there to back it up. 
So, and, and again, this was a long vacant building in a yeah. key location. Oh, so this isn't the one where a family was actually sort of running it, because there's another place in Randolph that where a single family had been very committed. No, that's a different problem. That's it, but do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. I yeah, do. okay. Yeah. We, I, we need to move yeah. along a little bit. Okay, um, I'm gonna rush through the rest of this and get to a couple things. Um, we are doing home ownership. We are working with the seven habitat chapters across Vermont. That's what this slide is about. Um, I will not um, spend any time on the economic impacts of housing development except to say um, they're substantial um, and were we about to be in a recession and someday we will, um, your economist will tell you that uh, building housing is a great economic stimulus and I think it is now. I want to go backwards. I don't understand this home ownership for workers. So this is just a profile of, we've done a little over 1,100 homes around the state uh, as permanently affordable home ownership using a shared appreciation model. And this just tells you what the various occupations are of all these homeowners. Uh, um, just to give you that sense. We haven't collected that d data historically about our rental housing. Uh, we will for the housing revenue bond, but I just, uh, people sometimes think that housing doesn't serve the workforce that we're involved in, and it clearly absolutely does. And I think, uh, in our rental housing, you'll see that with the exception of the elderly and disabled, people are the people who you might see at the Cumberland Farms, they may be um, at the uh, coffee place here in Montpelier, they may be at the supermarket, uh, they may be banging nails, but they are all working. Well, and the largest number are teachers. Or teachers' aides, or yeah. people who work at your library. Um, so we're on track to meet the goal. We're gonna exceed the goal of 550. I think we've made get above the 650 units. We're big on downtown revitalization. We are big on where our housing markets are very tight, adding to the supply. We're increasing the numbers of people who've been homeless getting into this housing. We're doing more mixed income. Uh, and then to get to the question that Senator Clarkson was asking about, uh, and we'll get to this in just a moment, um, incomes from wages and benefits are not growing at the pace of housing costs right. in Vermont. There's much more need than we have. We'll finish the bond in this calendar year and then our funding without more assistance will be down because we'll be servicing the debt on the bond. Without rental assistance, we don't get to the most vulnerable, lowest income folks and we need services. Um, we are doing an awful what's lot the, of- What's the primary source of rental assistance in the bond? Primary sources. Sitting over there, Mr. Williams and the Vermont State Housing Authority. There are nine local housing authorities. The state has two different programs, one at the Department of Health, Mental Health, and one that I think probably within Ken Schatz's shop that also provides a small amount of rental So we're talking about Section 8 and its successors? Yeah. The other source is, is the USDA Rural Development Program. Um, I'm not going to spend any time because I want to get to the big question on the charts you have on improving health and reducing costs, other than to say that the, uh, the medical center has been tracking this with CHT on several projects in terms of, and what you see is when people initially get housed, their health care costs go up and then as they get stabilized and then they go down. And then if you're trying to figure out, is this a good investment for the state? Uh, the next slide is about our support for people leaving corrections. We've spent about a million dollars uh, on about just about 100 beds in transitional facilities and corrections. These are their numbers, not ours. Says that's saving the correction system $3.7 million each year. Um, where is that? Hmm? Where is the savings? The savings it, is. I see three to seven. That's the savings. I thought you just said it was seven million. Three point seven. There's a big pipeline of projects to be done, uh, and I will not stop there. And then the more to be done. The Vermont Futures Project of the Chamber of Commerce has right. set a growth target of 5,000 new and improved housing units <coughs> annually. Uh, we work with the Agency of Human Services on something called the Roadmap to End Homelessness that called for 369 units of permanent supportive housing. Uh, you saw 22. 
of those in Brattleboro. We have a ways to go there. And they call for 1,251 new homes to people at the very lowest income. Our point in time survey last year said we had 1,291 homeless Vermonters on a single night. And the last major housing study that was done by, the, by Josh's department indicated that there was a statewide gap of about 6,000 homes that needed to be filled over a five year period. So we clearly need to do more. And then the very last thing I will leave you with is just where property transfer tax is at, which uh, was established as a barometer, a football funding source for the board uh, when it was increased back in the late 80s, and where we are with what our actual funding is. Um, so the blue line is what the transfer tax is producing. It's projected to go up by about $3 million this year. The orange line is what our statutory share would be, and it would be about $21.5 million. The budget proposed for us is actually down a million, a little over a million dollars this year. Um, and that is a combination of both capital budget and transfer tax allocations. Um, so the actual transfer tax we're projected to receive this year is uh, at around the $10 million level. And when you add in the bonds, we're still down a total from what we should be getting under the law by about six million. By, by what? Just about six million dollars. So, uh, if you know, that's where we step in, right? Fully funding you. We. Yeah. So, I'm happy to answer questions, but I know uh, you probably want to get to other weaknesses. I, I just want to um, sugar it down to a thought I had in the last biennium, which makes which made the bonding idea so attractive to me. Uh, and I realized that it, it put, what was suggested last year puts pressure on your ongoing budget and funding, because part of the funding of the interest of the bond came out of your budget. Am I correct so far? Interest uh, and principal. Yes. Yeah, interest, interest, interest and principal. Is the problem. Okay. But if your ongoing budget is designed to do, in part, many of the things that are in here on an ongoing basis. And I'm not suggesting we do any more of that or say anything about repaying that, but just the theory. And we have such a pressing need now, doesn't it make sense to take money that would otherwise be spent in the out years for developing housing, for interest and principal on a bond that could give us housing right now? It's a good question. And I wish you luck in answering it. And, uh, that, that, that was the theory behind the bond yeah. part, right? Um, so you know, I think jumpstart all this housing. And, and I think we've achieved that goal. We've jumpstarted an awful lot of activity all over the state. And I would say to you as we look at our pipeline, <laughs> It's whetted people's appetites to dream bigger yes. and think bigger. What we find is developers generally size their request to what they think is available and possible. And when you change the atmosphere about what's possible, people respond to that. Um, and, they, and that's why, you know, before this bond, most of the, a large project for us was going to be 30 units, and lots of them were 15 to 20, and now you're seeing. 60 and 70 unit buildings getting built and you're seeing other activity happening. And we're certainly seeing um, at the local level, whether it's St. Albans or Bennington or Montpelier or Brattleboro, people trying to figure out how do we really not just build housing because that's a need, but do it in a way that makes our community more vital, more active, and more sustainable. So the need is clearly there. The bond has been a success. Assuming the money was there for more, is the infrastructure or the or the, the experience with the bond show you that if we could find more resources, we can expand a program similar to the bond, or is there not enough builders, or are there not enough developers, or 
Um, I think the answer is yes, we could do more if we have more resources. Uh -huh. So if you think of the $37 million and we're putting that out, we're now in the third year and the, the infrastructure that you reference has been able to absorb and meet that and, and get the housing delivered at that level. In a relatively short period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just because seem, the it just, seems, was just seems to me everybody and his brother and sister are saying that housing is a problem from the homeless to the business community to the and it's a solution to a lot of ah. things yeah, I, so we gotta, we gotta have, i mean again i appreciate the one million dollars but if there's a way of doing more and we can think of it mm -hmm. i'd like to jump in on Maybe we could invite the treasurer in to get her creative we will. Ju we will. juices working, as I assume you're. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we, Beth, I assume you've engaged Beth in thinking yeah. about the future and how we might creatively solve this problem. Um, we've talked to the treasurer. I mean, the, the treasurer's chief concern is the bond rating of the state of Vermont, which is part of why we created this structure that did not make it a general obligation. I would note that two different governors in Massachusetts, Deval Patrick and Charlie Baker, each have bonded for over a billion dollars as part of the state's bonding for housing. We're not Massachusetts, but... Um, but we can certainly do a Vermont appropriate scale. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda. Thank you. So we've got about 25 minutes, I would say, Brenda. Uh, looking for more of the same, more on a local level, Jim County, but you know, a little bit about what you're doing, how you fit into this bond, and and where you see the future, uh, and whether you've experienced problems with the bond, or how's it going? Thank you. Thank you for your time today and the opportunity to comment. I uh, will give you a local perspective and not repeat detail on the projects you've already heard about. Um, so I'd start, I thought I'd start with just a brief thumbnail about us and then this current activity. Absolutely. Do you know uh, all of us? You know, no. Cheryl? So I you meet you. I just met you on the website. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Met you on the website. Met you. Nice to see you. Nice Brenda, to see you. as we say, <laughs> Literature or whatever is the Chittenden County Maha of housing. <laughs> so I was looking at that. Okay, well, whatever that means, thank you. Um, it means you're like the big cheese. <laughs> well, in fact, uh, the Queen Bee. Uh, it's good to know that uh, Champlain Housing Trust actually serves the three northwest counties of Vermont, Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle. And um, I want to speak about the current needs a little bit. and who we serve. Today we have about 3,000 affordable homes and all serving people from homelessness all the way to home ownership. 2,300 of these are conventional rentals, primarily serving the workforce. Uh, and some, though, uh, are special needs homes with services attached, as you've, as you've heard discussed. 615 of our homes are in our shared equity home ownership portfolio. Um, and I would say, that every one of our homes, maybe there's a fraction I can't remember, are affordable due to investments by the BHCB. And today, in addition to just describing this quickly, I want to bring a perspective to the discussion at the State House of the role that Vermont's playing as a model to the rest of the country. As you know, this housing crisis is not just Vermont's. It's an affordability crisis around the country, and I think it'd be very interested to know people in this building should know that everybody's trying to catch up with Vermont. So a few other facts about us. We have 38 commercial and nonprofit spaces. We provide financial counseling broadly in our community. Last year about 1,200 families used this. Most rents are by a home through us or they're in our homes and need financial support to sustain. It's something we do. But others take our classes so they can go on and buy in the market or sometimes rent. Um, the shared equity portfolio we have has served 1,145 families 
the majority of our sellers go on with the equity they built in our homes to buy in the market, freeing up the home for another family that needs affordability. It's a great. What percentage is it? We, last time we studied, it was almost two thirds. Yeah. But it's been a little while, so I just say down the majority. I yeah. don't want to overstate that. But and for the, over what period of time have we had this program? Um, Thirty-four years. First years, it was very slow to get homes online, but of course that speeds up. And again, uh, we're kept by resources, as 80, you mentioned. 84, 85? Yes, so 84. As, um, I, as I think I told you before, I wrote the first lease. <laughs> I can't find it, but I wrote oh, it. Oh, <laughs> I want to find that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's, yeah, there's the connections. Right, yeah, for months, a small home. So we operate also a loan and rehab program through VCDP. And this is very important in the rural regions especially to keep people warm and safe and healthy in homes when major systems fail. Uh, just a, I looked at the last five years, we served 98 families. And in those homes, 23 were homes where people who were disabled who needed accessibility. 31 were households of people over the age of 62. So this is a critical life safety and we really appreciate working with the VCDP team on that. We also help people statewide to secure energy efficient, better quality mobile homes through the tax credit program that was initiated after Irene. Um, and in all, we served 152 households with that one. And the average income of those buyers is 39,500. Very important rural home program. Uh, we again are capped, they, they go the minute we open the program and then we're sold out quickly. 16% uh, of all of our rentals so, now. Wait, I just ask yes. a question. Yeah. So your mobile home project is something that we all benefit from, not just your three northern counties, right? Yes, that, so that's statewide. I just want to make sure everybody mm -hmm. understands that the mobile home project is the one project of yours that is really statewide. Yes, and uh, thank you. I skipped over that, but the other home ownership centers do the customer and just refer them to us for the lending part. So it's something that's delivered to the centers statewide and people have that local connection, but we, we do the lending because selling the credit is a, it's a thing. So we do it. It's a thing. It's, it's a, a thing. thing. We do yeah, it. Yeah, it's a thing. No, it's a good thing. You know, it's, uh, it just helps everybody. We did after our game because we weren't so affected by the storm and other regions were. Sure. So, okay. um, and 16% of all of our rentals are serving people who were homeless at one time. And last year, 88 of our 313 vacancies in our homes were rented up to people who were making that first step. So as part of this, which is a core strategic plan goal of ours, we also deliver an array of services and programs to help people stay housed, from budget to financial counseling, loans, rent forbearance, to deep social work and case management in partnership with other agencies. Now, we just celebrated our annual meeting uh, last week with about 250 members and guests. So I'll give you some highlights of what we're reporting from the year. And I did bring some annual reports for those of you who like paper, uh, or tolerate paper. I don't know, but thank you. We have 136 apartments under construction as we speak. And certainly, you've heard of those 60 in South Burlington, 76 at Cambrian. And this spring, we'll start building 30 permanently affordable condos at Cambrian Rise. This being the first phase of 96 required by the city's inclusionary design program. So that matched up with the funding um, is very important. Last year, we also purchased, with help from VHCB and social capital lenders, a rental complex of 105 apartments that were unsubsidized but affordable to people at 80% median and below. We call this naturally occurring affordable housing. Housing is just state affordable in the market. And we did it to prevent their sale and conversion to higher market rents. This would have been uh, displaced many working families right from the heart of South Burlington where we're trying to build more affordable housing. We are building more affordable housing. As we have recently seen in Essex and elsewhere in Chittenden County, and Gus mentioned this as an initial impetus with subsidized housing to creating the conservation board, but it's also happening in Chittenden County in our market. It's so hot that people sell their rental developments and boost the rents. 
So we're trying to play in that space and keep those affordable. It serves a broad part of the workforce. Coming up in development, you heard about Maiden Lane in St. Albans. But we're also working on a home ownership project in Winooski. We're in the initial phases of figuring out how to finance at, at scale in Winooski. And we're also working with another uh, apartment owner on, uh, for another 88 rentals that are naturally occurring affordable and hope to be able to put together some financing to keep those affordable. And we are exploring a large new construction opportunity in Hinesburg that will be a mix of home ownership rental and then we have to fund the next phase of Cambrian Rise. So we have a lot uh, so upcoming. Bre so Brenda, yep. in home ownership, yep. all your home ownership are perpetually affordable, right? Yes, they are. But other rental units are not necessarily all yep. permanently affordable, right? Yes, they are. We do as our mission. They may be for people above 80 percent, we call that unrestricted, but we will keep them at 80 percent or as close to as possible does, because of our mission. Does the goal of keeping rental units permanently affordable, does that compromise the affordability now? Is there some sort of hidden cost in terms of what you have to charge? Um, I guess from, from my mind, I'm thinking the hidden cost may be if you make all your units perpetually affordable, there's probably less units you can develop because there's more subsidy put into the ones that you are putting on the market. Yeah, we need the capital to make them affordable. There's no question. But it is the biggest bang for your buck. You will never create as much affordability by pouring market money into the market because that's a leaky bucket. You pour the money into the you know, market, then the homes will become less affordable as soon as they possibly can. Yeah. And so even though, yes, it costs more up front, but we're using private investment, 50% of the new production. Um, now we're using uh, new kinds of social impact investing to create affordability for equity. Because at whatever level, even if you go 80 to 100%, if you keep it there and don't gentrify it, you're providing a lasting benefit to your community. It's infrastructure for the whole community. So I, I'm a strong believer in this, and I've seen it work. And I, uh, I, I think it's it's the and it's an infrastructure that is worth investing because that's, he's, that's he's true. The that's true of all the community housing developers throughout Vermont. And is it part of is it a condition of money that's loaned given out by DHCB that one of the places the HCB statute is for permanent affordability. The state con plan says that all public funds need to go into housing that's permanently affordable. Okay. That has served us really, really well um, okay. over time. So I wanted uh, just a couple of other things that we are uh, on the boards for development. One is a transitional housing project with STEPS, which is folks who serve people at, uh, escaping domestic violence, and also recovery housing. And these would both be in existing buildings at the fort. Uh, are looking at developing. Uh, we're also developing a community center in Burlington, and we've almost raised all the funds for that. It's a historic building, an old school. We're serving 4,000 people a year already with parks, programs, recreation, and so on. But importantly, and I wanted to talk about this, uh, there's 800 people a year who are refugees and new Americans being served in the building every service you can think of, from job training to language training, citizenship assistance, but also integrating with the rest of the community with senior programs, youth programs, and so on. And where it's is tremendous. It? It's in Burlington, it's Old North End, um, down the street. So uh, we also continue to lead in the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance and have secured a three-year grant from Key Bank Foundation to expand those housing retention services I talked about. These have been recognized nationally and we're actually being training folks in other states in uh, these uh, housing retention services. So in, in that work, we still see how much the real solution to homelessness is affordable housing. And, we, and we're trying to tackle here and you've been so supportive with that we appreciate. We know that we need to do more. And you asked this question earlier. We have the capacity to produce more. Our only constraint is the affordable capital. We have the opportunities coming to us. We have the sites coming to us. And we have to size it to the capital available. 
Each month, we talk about need, we get 70 full applications for our rental housing, but we only have 10 to 15 vacancies. Everybody else goes on a waiting list. They have to wait a long time because there's so few vacancies. Our building homes campaign with uh, Housing Vermont, which is for Chittenden County, calls for 3,500 new homes in Chittenden over five years, with 700 of those being permanently affordable. This was a very broad coalition of support we had in our county for this. And the number was identified by regional planning. So we are on track in Chittenden for production overall, but we are falling short of the affordable goal. For the reasons I said, we have only 191 homes in the works for the first two years, and we should be at 280. So that's the gap we're chasing. Which is overall not affordable. I'm sorry, what's, what's the goal in, in to build more affordable housing in, and in how many years? It was 700 homes Seven. over five years. Okay. Yeah. So that was a boost over what had been done, so it was the 35 of what had been done. Um, so the only reason we were at not 191 actually is because of the bond, thank you. Uh, which is a tremendous a boost to production, and we need more. We need more affordable capital to produce homes for the housing wage gap that we see people facing in our region. So I, I want to speak now to my concern that VHCB is not funded at the statutory level, because it, when you see the value of the production you get in the lasting results, why wouldn't it be? You know, that uh, you talked about everybody talking about housing need, but one thing that's really stayed with me is that VPR poll in the fall that said that the leading cause of stress and anxiety among Vermont families is housing affordability. And you know, if you can't, if you're worried about that, that's a lot of strain on your family otherwise. And no wonder, the housing gap is very, very high in our region, even for semi-skilled and, and, and starting professional jobs, as you saw in the home ownership jobs. A lot of those jobs in healthcare care and, and uh, teachers' aides and stuff are also in our rentals. Um, people working 40 hours a week should not be insecure about keeping a roof over their heads. And the big insecurity comes from if you're paying 60% of your income, 50% to housing, there's very little left. And we saw this nationally, right? They talked about this during that shut down and people couldn't save, couldn't save for these bumps that everybody faces. So that was closer to disaster. This is, there is a national affordability crisis. It's not just a Vermont story. But in Vermont, which is a high cost market as all of New England does for construction and other this, we've come together to address the crisis in a way that is now sought out all over the country. Permanent affordability is the most effective. You ask this question, way to deliver affordable housing, and it's the only durable way. It's the only way you can plan to have affordable housing into the future in your desirable locations, your downtowns, and so on. Now, other states and city governments that are dealing with homelessness and stress on their workforce are figuring this out. In the last five years, there's been a huge rise in communities creating inclusionary zoning as an example of permanent affordability. There's now 880 plus um, jurisdictions doing this and many just getting started. And most will use a community land trust for stewardship as we do in Vermont. I'm a board member past president of the national network that serves community land trusts nationally and local governments implementing these kinds of permanent affordability uh, initiatives. It's called Ground and Solutions Network. And our growing staff at Grounded Solutions can't keep up. What's it called? Ground? Grounded Solutions. Yeah. Grounded. Grounded. Because it is grounded in land. Make your housing affordable here. Um, so, Grounded Solutions has long been funded by the Ford Foundation and the Institute for Land Policy. But more recently now, it's major bank foundations getting into the action. Citibank is supporting efforts in DC and other metro areas implementing new CLTs at scale. J.P. Morgan Chase is supporting the new Houston CLT, which will do 1,000 homes in its first phase. Denver and Atlanta are implementing large citywide CLTs as part of their mass transit initiatives because they realize that if housing is built near transit stops and not preserved as affordable, these locations will become the most costly locations, defeating the purpose of workforce housing planning. So just some random examples of, to show you the interest in Vermont specifically. 
Shared equity home ownership and community land trusts were incorporated into the latest uh, financial services reform, duty to serve provisions, and we were one of the sites for Freddie Mac to, to plan its, uh, its new uh, product. NeighborWorks America has just designated new funding for shared equity home ownership, and we were tapped to give the advice to their leadership on how to do it. Two weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal featured CHT and our model in Market Watch. You have seen that. And the NPR Climate Solutions podcast recently, recently featured CHT and the new urban CLTs that are addressing mass transit. So, in spite of having this national resource, we're still tapped very much to respond. And I wanted to let you know that that's not about us. That is because Vermont is a generation ahead of the rest of the country in this use of permanent affordability. People are trying to catch up. We are the proof of concept. So why in the world would we go backwards? If we had been funding at the statutory level every year, we'd be 60 million more ahead. And I believe that we'd be, have much less of a housing crisis here had we done that. And I would really encourage you all who are look, asking us what, what you should do. There is no better solution uh, than that, I think. Uh, I think it's been addressed, so I'll just say briefly. The property transfer tax revenue is, when it's growing, is a sign of our robust real estate economy. And, but the increased value also prices some people out. So using a small portion of that, you know, to address all everybody's housing needs was and is a brilliant and elegant way to mitigate the downsides of gentrification and, uh, and development. So it's an investment I think you've seen in our people today, but we commit to you to, for the future. I think every dollar invested in conservation and affordable housing by BHCB, which I think of together just as rural economic and community development. Yeah, that is what our, our real estates need, uh, is what's being done here. And diverting this money elsewhere, I, I know it always goes to important things, and, but I, would, I doubt that you get the lasting benefit um, and the high return on investment that you get from all the VHCB funded projects around the state. So I'll just leave it at that. So maybe this question is better directed to Gus, but um, the last year the VHB appropriation or transfer tax allocation was reduced to pay the interest uh, on a bond at principal. How, how was the 50 50 split between housing and conservation maintained? Um, the last several years, it's been 60-40, um, uh, probably historically over 30 years, it's about 55-45. So 60-40 has been a result of a notwithstanding? In four no, that, that, that's been a basically just to allowed to do that? The statute doesn't say, the statute just says spend the money in a balanced way without defining okay. balance. The only guidance is if we ever hit 70% for either purpose in our annual report, we have to specifically tell you why. So uh, there, there is some discretion for the board, and we basically make that decision really as a matter of our interaction with the legislature and with the administration and with advocates and then looking at the pipeline and trying just to figure it out. So, okay, so Brenda, just one last question. Your opinion as well, the bond's been very successful, yes. and there aren't any like flags out there that we should be concerned about how it's working? No, I, I think <laughs> we're running out of it fast. Uh, but I would say if we do the bond and we don't do it as an add to what we've been doing, you're not going to get the boost to production that you want. If it just replaces other money, if we then say, there's less money for BHCB because we did the bond, then you're just evening it out. And I think the purpose of the bond, as we understood it, was because we were falling so far behind and we needed to catch up in production. So wherever you put it, um, no, I think the bond has worked very, very well with our other affordable housing and engaged more, it seems, larger developments that are public-private partnerships, something we've been doing for a long time in Chittenden, but it's terrific. 
but okay. don't make it a replacement or you're not going to get the results. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll leave these passes around and... Did you uh, send it electronically to Kayla? Of course, yes. You I did. finished it so no. late yesterday. I didn't Great. Send it around. What did you say, I was going to say, you, you will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy behind you? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's this? Oh, this is your annual report. Do we have another copy for Kayla? Because we need one on file for the. Uh, with all things, we need six copies. Do you do you have an extra? Uh, Brenda, do you have an extra copy of your testimony for Kayla? I'm, I'm going to have to send it to you electronically. We need it electronically anyway. So. Oh, oh, I see. You've got a lot of priorities. <laughs> you always it's a complex problem. <laughs> <laughs> Multifaceted. Why are we surprised? Why are we not surprised? So, uh, for the record, uh, Erhard Monk testifying on behalf of the Vermont Global Housing Coalition. Um, I, I really think that a lot um, of what I was going to say has been said already, and I'm looking at the time well, I here. Forgot, it's I forgot. 10 to 12. Another witness. So. Yeah. We have Dick? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can start today. So let me just quickly say for folks who may not be familiar with the coalition, we're approximately 80 members strong, mostly organizations, and um, you know, folks sitting behind me, the organizations are. Um, Part of that, uh, part of that coalition, and so what you see on the yellow sheet is a comprehensive set of priorities that um, really addresses uh, the whole multifaceted um, issue of affordable housing, uh, from rental housing to um, home ownership to supportive services for people with the greatest needs to rental assistance to help fill uh, the gap for our lowest income for uh, Vermonters. Just quickly note, um, when Josh was here earlier uh, and talked about the housing budget, just a, a quick kind of side uh, footnote on that, that is state funding, or funding that passes through a state or quasi-state entity. It does not include the money that passes through our local housing authorities. It also doesn't include the money that passes through the city of Burlington, which itself is an entitlement community. So um, it's not... It, we, hope, we were hoping that it would be the complete picture, but since it doesn't include those, it's, it's not an absolute complete picture of all the, all the money that comes into the state for affordable housing from uh, state, uh, from federal, federal resources, as well as um, local, local resources. And uh, I'll also just um, mention, um, you know, I've been involved in housing and community development for over 30 years, and one of the things that I, I, I would say I've been proudest of is a um, longtime member of uh, the uh, board of the Northgate Housing um, Complex in, in Burlington, Northgate Residence Ownership Corporation, which uh, Brenda was absolutely pivotal in uh, uh, preserving. And it is one of the preservation projects that was pivotal in the late 80s um, that um, we learned from and that helped inform uh, the policy that's been enshrined in, 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 in state policy uh, since that time, that when we put public dollars, uh, whether they're federal or state, into affordable housing, uh, that the requirement would be that that housing remain permanently, uh, permanently affordable. And it was, you know, from some of the uh, really uh, unfortunate lessons that we learned during the 80s when we did lose hundreds of units um, of uh, USDA-funded uh, housing. Um, and one of the things I'll add in terms of the affordability, I can't give you the exact rental numbers, but we have a complicated tiered, multi-tiered rent structure at Northgate. And since Northgate has been, in essence, in the public um, mission-driven domain and has been uh, run, in essence, as a mission-driven nonprofit by its residents since 1990, um, our, and we have market rate units, our market rate rents are significantly below 
uh, the market rate rents in, in the greater Chittenden uh, County, significantly below. I can provide those for you, but that's one of the consequences of being able to um, operate uh, affordable housing that's funded with public resources like VHCD and Northgate and the history of Northgate and the creation of VHCD all kind of um, are, are part and parcel of our, our uh, state housing history because uh, one of the reasons we need to create Northgate um, VHCD back in the, in the 80s was to help preserve um, developments like Northgate and others. Um, Bra um, Brattleboro has Westgate, um, Applegate and Bennington, uh, Highgate and Barry, and, and other legacy HUD and USDA funded projects. And really, I, I would say, you know, for me, kind of the, it sounds a little slogan esque, but uh, I would say the, the, the easiest or the best, the, sorry, the least um, expensive uh, housing to create is uh, the affordable housing that you preserve. Um, it needs to be preserved right. over, over time. Uh, if we were to try and redevelop Northgate at this point in Chittenden County, in the North End of Burlington, it would cost, uh, I, I can't even estimate how many times more than the public dollars that we put into it uh, 20 years, uh, 30, almost 30 years ago. Um, and there's since been some additional infusions, but that's natural in the cycle of uh, real estate development. Um, you do need to put um, additional capital resources into uh, projects, but at least we don't have to rebuy the project all over again from the private sector owner that uh, initially developed it with a, a great you know, sweetheart HUD deal and operating subsidies that came in every, every month. Um, so that being said, um, we do have a long list uh, on pages two, three, and four of, uh, of, of the yellow sheet. Uh, the first page really captures a number of the needs statistics that you've heard from other witnesses before. Um, the VPR poll that was done this last fall, the roadmap to end homelessness and the quantification of, I mean, we have a number, we know how many units it would take to end homelessness in Vermont in five years. We're, one of the, we're a small state, um, we're maybe a little under-resourced because of that, but because of our size, um, we can also quantify these things, and we had um, this consultant come in uh, with support from the General Assembly a couple of years ago, uh, and they told us exactly what it would take to end homelessness in Vermont, and, and, and we know that number. Um, uh, where is that? Uh, it's on page one. I know, um, but I'm trying to, of sorry. all the bullets, it seems yeah, yeah. impenetrable. Ro roadmap to end homelessness is probably about, um, where is it? Um, oh, here it is. It's the fifth it's, one. It's about halfway down the page. Yep, I see it. Um, yep. And 368. It's 368 new units of permanent supportive housing and 1,251 new homes made affordable, um, rental homes made affordable <laughs> to very low income Vermonters um, through a combination of sources. And I, I know you've heard the three legged stool a number of times, but I'll just re emphasize all three legs are absolutely essential to solving not just the homeless. Uh, crisis, but the issue of uh, work, uh, housing for the workforce and housing just for low-wage service sector workers that cannot afford uh, market rents really anywhere in the state of Vermont if they're working at or near our minimum wage. And I'll provide more testimony on that um, Thursday when you hear um, more testimony on the, on the minimum wage. So last year, or the year before, you gave us um, a county roughly a cost of housing and rental units per county. Um, that was really useful. I was going to provide that to you on Thursday. Um, okay, great. Right. Um, it's the, the, the right. state's housing wage and then the housing wage broken down by, by county uh, based on what it costs to afford a uh, typical a modest two-bedroom apartment based on the Section 8 fair market rents uh, and not paying more than 30% of the income. It, that was a very useful tool every time I talk about whether you're talking about minimum wage, whether you're talking about um, challenges in one's own backyard. So um, I, I, I will provide that on, on Thursday. Uh, right. I'd like to get Richard on yeah, five sure. minutes if you don't mind. And then you both could probably come back to I'm here every day. Okay. And we'll just one Thursday. quick question. And, we'll see and State House Sanders is 8 o'clock. Senator Thursday. Brock has a question for you. I just wonder if you uh, would be able to give us a copy of your audited financial statement as well as the national letter. So we're a very small uh, organization. Our annual budget is uh, only about eighty thousand dollars. We don't get audited, but we can okay. certainly. Then, uh, five one two three. I'm asking for the wrong thing. I'm asking for that was That's the champagne. Yeah, 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 the coalition is. Yeah, yeah I didn't realize. Yeah, I thought you were also speaking for. Uh, 
Yeah, the audit. Yeah, I like the audited financial statement as well as the management letter. Just for the record, though, we do file a 990 right, right. Every, just every year, out, and it's available. I can provide it. If oh, you okay, get it. It's not going to tell you a lot. <laughs> no, I get that online. That's not a problem. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Might have been more depressing if we hadn't gotten rid of the uh, shutdown on Friday, right? Well, you know, we're only funded for three weeks, Senator. That's so. true. So Sorry. Still, yeah. still an issue. So, for the record, my name is uh, Richard Williams. I'm the executive director. I'm working on my 45th year at working in for Vermont State Housing Authority. And I'd be glad to give you our financial audit and management letter if you'd like, because uh, we do go through, obviously. So, just to give you an idea, uh, you threw a curveball at me, uh, Mr. Chairman, when I came in, because I was prepared to kind of talk about the federal shutdown and right. what the impact it was. So I am just going to throw a couple numbers at you so, uh, so that you realize, first of all, we're a quasi-state public agency. Uh, we do not receive any direct funding from the, uh, under this great uh, building. Uh, but we do subcontract with the Department of Mental Health. We run their mental health voucher program. We do, some, uh, we do subcontract uh, with Agency of Human Services as far as inspecting their Vermont rental subsidy program units. Uh, we also work, uh, there's a uh, bridge to HAPA, which is housing opportunities for people with AIDS. There's a small program that the uh, state of Vermont has that we contract and run that. We also contract with Vermont Housing Conservation Board to run that housing opp opportunity for people with AIDS, HAPA program as we refer to it. So there's two big pro uh, projects, uh, programs that are fund rental assistance here. Uh, we're uh, actually assisting uh, 7,233 households in Vermont. Uh, that's uh, through two main programs. One is called the Project-Based Section 8 uh, program. The, uh, there's 114 projects. Those projects were done by through private developers around the state of Vermont. The annual uh, federal contribution on that is $27 million a year. How many, how many units do you get that? that? That is 3,076 units in 114 projects. And the annual funding on that is $27 million, which is, which is uh, which the Deputy uh, Commissioner of Housing has put in the, in, uh, the investment report that he presented this morning to. Sorry, Richard, I'm sorry. I thought you said you assisted 7,200 households, we did. not for we do. Yeah, so, so it's 140. So I'm going to get to the Section 8 program too. Okay. So, oh, okay. So right now we're just talking about project based. These are the old traditional contract administration, uh, Section 8 new construction, sub rehab. Some of us in the in the room here are old enough to know and remember those programs that used to be funded by uh, directly from the federal Department of Health and Care Development. The other program we have is the. Uh, is the uh, Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program that used to be known as different things, uh, Section 8 Certificate Program. That program started in 1974. That, uh, that program uh, uh, is, uh, this is the second I just brought my stats here, uh, is uh, there's 3,894 Housing Choice Voucher Program uh, uh, units in the state. That is, uh, you mean 3,776 households. And that's an annual appropriation that we receive from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is uh, 32 million, a little over 32 million, 261 thousand dollars. So you, you're getting about $60 million right. as a pass through. Is that number gone up or down over the last decade? Uh, it's gone up, it hasn't gone up in like, you know, the early years, you know, when funding was better out of Washington, you know, we would, we would get, you know, we could anticipate we would get annual allocations of vouchers or whatever. Uh, also, many of the, I don't know if you want to call them HUD boutique programs, uh, uh, you know, back in the 80s, uh, some were very similar to what the Deputy Commissioner of Housing was talking about this morning. And I know that Earhart is as old as I am, so he recognizes and remembers some of these old programs. Uh, but HUD used to have what they call a Section 8 uh, rental rehab program uh, back in the early 
80s that combined uh, subsidies and also uh, uh, additions of you know loan money. There's also a Section 8 moderate rehab program. Uh, you may remember, uh, well, there's still one in St. Johnsbury, uh, which has recently been purchased by a nonprofit, but uh, Depot Apartments. Uh, there's also the one in Windsor, you know, which used to be called, uh, I'm not sure what they call it now, but I remember the old name that was 75 units down there. Uh, Is that the one along um, Union Street? Yep, Union Street. God, it's it gorgeous. To, it the the renovation of it is terrific. Thanks to all the funding yeah. agencies uh, that uh, that participated that is. But it's but still it, Section 8, right? It is. It yeah. has Project Base Section 8. So, so when so the HUD stopped doing that, the renovation money, they, they don't no longer well, basically what have they did a renovation they, program. They sort of jacked, what we're up, stepping the, into they the jacked up the community development block grant program. And you know, it used to go through the community uh, development and planning division of HUD. Uh, so a lot of these programs get repealed. And you know, as monies get tighter in Washington, programs right. have come as back. leadership has different so, priorities. So, is it a misstatement or a myth of some sort that federal support for low-income housing has dropped precipitously over the last few yes. decades? It's well, federal funding. We're not losing funding uh, at my agency, but we're not gaining any. So, so it's just. Been so that's yeah. losing because you're not keeping up with the Well, we haven't kept it up with the CPI, that's for right. sure. Right, you're not you're keeping not. up with CPI, so that means you're losing. So, uh, but you can imagine where we would be if we didn't have the federal rental assistance here in Vermont. One of the things that you, we get forgotten a lot about at ribbon cuttings and, and, and presentations because project-based vouchers really do bring capital to the new construction of the projects that are being funded through low-income in, low housing tax credits and, you know, and the HCB or whatever. It's, a, it's that guarantees the operating, uh, helps guarantee the operating subsidies for the project. For example, French Blocks just opened up here in Montpelier. We put five project-based vouchers in that. It's made a 20-year commitment. That's $1,500,000 of federal rental assistance that's been committed to that project. And where is that? Right here in downtown, over the Amish Office. Over? Amish Office in Mount Fair here. Oh, right, right. Yeah, just opened up. And uh, uh, Jen Holler mentioned uh, the project in, in Brattleboro, the, uh, which is, you know, assisting homeless. You know, the, the, great, mm -hmm. the Great River Terrace, or whatever it's called. That's correct. And uh, that, uh, that had, uh, we made a commitment for full project based offers on that. So you asked for a couple ideas, and I was thinking there, you know, and I hadn't seen the governor's, because uh, uh, we don't get, I ask questions, you know, what's in the budget, you know, or what's in, you know, and we don't get told that, but uh, because I understand, uh, we don't know until you folks know. So, uh, which was a coincidence when I was listening to the state of the state, of the state and also listening to the budget was that we've been pitching this concept uh, a little bit to the Deputy Commissioner of Housing, and it's called Accessory Dwelling Units. And it's based on a program or a project, and I, I wish the Senator was here because it's based on a... Uh, she's up at a press conference, so she's representing us all. So it's based on the concept of a very successful program in Brattleboro, with, which has added uh, many uh, units to housing uh, without a lot of restrictions or uh, constraints. What's that project called? And basically, it's you know it's it's the Bradboro uh, Accessory Dwelling Unit Program, and oh. I, I can give you some information on that. But you know, so off the top of my head, you know, it's it's a small commitment of funds that you know has opened up units within you know larger homes, or you know, they've even seen you know like a, a garage converted into a rental space for not a lot of money, and I've always miss the Section 8 rental assistance program here in the state because that really got into a lot of small mom and pop landlords and you know helped them out with some a small amount of money to, to create a unit. So we're not talking like to the extent of the you know of the the great work that Vermont Housing Conservation Board has done. I mean we're not talking new new brand new units or substantial rehabilitation units, which that program funds and does a great job at it. I'm just talking about 
someone that might be struggling to pay their property taxes or something and they could use an apartment, a small one, you know, like a one bedroom or efficiency apartment, you know, in their, you know, so and they have this big so what, home. Is, what is the governor's proposal? Well, it's sort of it's sort of kind of going down the same road. So, I, so I, I thought that when I heard that, I said, "Well, I said, you know, uh, we do have something in common." So, uh, but you know, that's the one million dollars. It could be used for ADUs as well in the right scenario. So we have some uh, uh, not much. We have one hundred fifty fifty thousand dollars. You know that. You, Senator, may remember some of the old enable programs that was funded through, it actually came through Office on Aging way back in the 80s and stuff, and you know, we did excessive, you know, accessible units. We wrote some grants and got grant money from the state to do that. And we've recirculated that over through, you know, like a revolving loan type fund. So it always comes back. So we've used that kind of money, and so that's something that we would pledge towards this along with the with some, yeah, with yeah. some like grant monies, which we would have to access through the CDBG process, which would have to come in through a city or a town, for example, would have to apply to uh, the agency uh, for funding, and if it was competitive. Uh, one of the things uh, the HUD consolidated plan that the deputy commissioner re referred to, uh, I would like to encourage the, the deputy commissioner to consider setting aside monies or pilot programs to, to look at different uh, initiatives uh, uh, that could create housing, you know, in Vermont. You know, so sometimes it doesn't take a lot, uh, but you know, we have to. You know, if you get into certain types of housing, then you hit all the codes and you know the sprinkler systems and all that stuff. So we're not talking that. We're just talking, you know, creating some uh, some yeah. good, affordable, basic. Dick, do you okay. think that incentive of five to seven is enough? Well, I think you'd have to combine it. You know, so you might have a seven thousand dollar grant, and then you know we were thinking about uh, you know offering maybe a seven thousand dollar loan, but then if you go to a local community banker, you might be able to leverage. You know, a homeowner might be able to leverage additional money because they've had some grant monies. Or in what we would do is we would do a deferred loan, zero interest. If the property sold or something, you know, the, the money would be paid back. You know, might be forgiven after five years or so, or something like that. But not a lot of rules and regulations because you're not giving them a lot of money, right. so you don't want to. Don't you know, encumber it. You mean exactly? There would be an encumbrance. You know, if there, we would, you know, put some type of restriction on your deed or something. You know, so, but, so that was an idea. But and also the rental rehab program. You know, was. Uh, Really jumped out as I remember. Well, it was, actually, I think, I think the, actually Earhart maybe a ran one in the city of Winooski. Uh, it, it was money available for urban areas, uh, consortia of towns and and the states. That's what we did. Actually, one of the laws that I was I was proud of in my former years working for seniors was getting through the accessory apartment bill, uh, which makes it somewhat easier because the big thing was zoning and you know multiple family units being disallowed in a lot of areas but when we did it we had a restriction that that would only be available for where the person moving in was 55 or over has that been eliminated that anybody could move into an accessory unit now yeah that really i, I don't think it's been that ex you know that there was some attempts around the state to, to try this this program, and there's been kind of some starts and stops. Uh, and, and you want to answer that? Money there? Sure. Uh, for the record, Eric Monka for the Housing Coalition. So, as part of our comprehensive revisions of uh, Chapter 117, the state's land use planning law, over 10 years ago, um, the um, accessory dwelling provisions of that law were liberalized. Uh, because as the chair pointed out, it used to be hard to get those approved locally. They were mostly subject to conditional use approval by a local zoning board or development review board. And so the state established minimum criteria for accessory dwelling units that allowed for them to be approved by rights uh, under, local, under local zoning. Um, and they have a uh, minimum um, kind of percentage um, Requirements that the ADU can't be, I think, more than if I right, remember. Right, but there's no age. There's no age. There's no age restriction. Okay. No age restriction. And, yeah. Um, just yeah, just to add to that, that's exactly the case. The ADU can't be bigger than the house itself. Right, it has to be below thirty percent. It needs to be an accessory. Right. 
exactly. it has to be truly accessory. It could be no more than 30% within the existing footprint of an existing building, or if it's like a carriage house or a barn, um, you know, or, or, or a garage that's being converted, it can't be more than 30% of the principal dwelling. Just, just as way of history, it was a Battle Royale just to get that law established as a conditional use yeah. because many communities want to just ban that. Right. And we said that they had to look at that as a conditional use at least. So I think it was the first of its kind in the country. So that, and later that's a program wanting to capitalize on the right. legislation right. that you yeah. involved. Yeah. Inexpensive. Plus it also for seniors. It deals with caregiving. Uh, Correct. With by your family member. So. Thank you okay. for the opportunity.